scripture was taken from the 50th chapter of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 50, verses 1 through 11, and focusing in today on verse 4 says, The Sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. I want to say a word today on the subject, influencing the mind. Influencing the mind. Christian education, as you know, is a real passion of mine, not just because I hold a position, but because I believe that Christian education influences how, can influence how a person thinks how a person processes information and processes experiences. How a person thinks is a major determinant about how he or she will act, and in fact has a significant role in determining the kind of person that they will be. Christian education. I believe that the mind which is the receiver and processor of information. And the spirit, which is the place where beliefs are stored and held, have a reciprocal relationship. There's an exchange that goes on between the mind and the spirit. And what is born out of that exchange, that relationship, is what determines a person's words, actions, and reactions. What do I mean by that? We take in information, and we're taught things all the time. That, combined with what we ex observe and experience, form conclusions called beliefs that we store in our spirit. As I go through life, what's in my spirit, what I believe, will determine how I respond. The hopes and dreams that I harbor, the possibilities that I embrace, and the difference that I believe I can make in the world. Um, also, how I deal with adversity. If I'm taught negativity, all I see and experience is negativity, then my life becomes all about reacting to negativity. Then add to that the fact that we begin the process in brokenness of spirit because original of original sin which predisposes our spirit towards self-centeredness. And the fact that we're under continual spiritual attack from an enemy that's bent on destroying us. We begin the process headed for destruction. But the good news is that Jesus came to renew and restore our broken spirits. If anyone be in Christ, he, she is a new creation. And deposit, also to deposit within our spirits a helper known as the Holy Spirit. But the next step is to fix the exchange, the conversation between the mind and the spirit. Called, a process that is called renewing our minds. We need to take in some new information that will reinforce our new beliefs and therefore, with the help of the Holy Spirit, foster change in our actions and our words. If this is not done, then words and behaviors will largely remain unchanged and development, growth, hope, Love and spiritual power will be hindered in our lives. If this is not done, then although people are nominally Christian, 
Maybe church members, maybe regular attenders, may even sit on boards. That's right. There will not be an observable difference in people who embrace Jesus Christ. This is what Christian education, or stated another way, Christian discipleship does. It provides new information in biblical context to change the inner conversation between a person's mind and their spirit. When we become believers, again, the Holy Spirit comes to live in our spirit. But we need to feed our mind so that the conversation between the mind and the spirit is as it should be. Are you understanding what I'm saying? I mean, to change the inner conversation between mind and spirit, thus influencing beliefs and behaviors. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So it's absolutely critical that a believer begin to take in some biblical information on a regular basis once they have received Christ by faith. That's why Jesus quoted Moses and said, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Because there's such a thing as, a, as spiritual abortion. Even when a person receives spiritual renewal, if they take in toxic material into the mind all the time, it can at very least counteract and at very worst completely neutralize what the Spirit of God is attempting to do in a person's spirit. The trouble is that the toxic stuff tends to feel more natural and appeals to the old us. Are you hearing me today? Talk back to me if you understand what I'm saying. The, the toxic stuff feels more natural. And just like with Jesus, Satan will apply sweetener to the poison and make it seem really appealing and it will feed our old nature. He'll put it in your face and tell you it's good, just like he did with Adam and Eve. Amen. But, but, but the good news is that the Holy Spirit is inside of us, pushing us spiritually to eat healthy. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the natural and in the spiritual. Amen. Pushing us to eat healthy so that we're never quite comfortable with the poison. Amen. The question Who's, who is, is whose influence are we under at any given moment? The fall of humankind in Genesis. God wanted man and woman to be under God's influence and God's alone. But because they listened to the voice of the enemy through the serpent, they were influenced to view the situation differently and they disobeyed God. As a result of this, all people inherit inherit a sin nature or a ten natural tendency towards sin. Ever, ever since that day, every human being being born on the earth is by nature under the influence of that tendency. The question to ask is, what is it that can restore control so that we can be under God's influence rather than being under the influence of the old nature. What choices can we make that will restore us, to restore our minds to be becoming influenced by God? In Isaiah chapter 50, the prophet is attempting to call Israel home, to encourage them to repent from their sins and to return to God. The people have expressed feelings of being forsaken because they find themselves in defeat and they find themselves in captivity. They experience all of these negative circumstances and they wonder, where is our God in all of this? Have you ever asked that question? Where is God in all of this? Has God cast us away? Has God divorced us? But God's response is, I have not divorced you. I have not put you away or forsaken you. But you made the choice to be under the influence of people around you instead of being under the influence of my word. 
You see, they were under threat of attack and God was saying to them, just trust me. Don't turn, don't try to cut deals with folk. Just trust my word. Just trust what I'm saying to you. Amen. Amen. God, God, God is saying, and now, you, you made your choice to trust your ability to wheel and deal with neighboring nations instead of doing what I told you to do, which is just to sit and trust me and trust what I say. You are under the influence of your own fears and not under the influence of faith or my word to, to, and my ability to work it out. So, he says, your sins separated you from me. That's why you find yourself in captivity. I did not divorce you. You divorced yourself. Beloved, sometimes when it gets to crunch time, we can really see under whose influence we are. You can really see who's under the influence of God's word and who's under the influence of self or who's being influenced by the enemy. When troubles rise, the things that you've always depended on start to let you down. Your reactions during those times often demonstrate who you really trust and who really drives you. When, when you're under the influence, well, who, what you're under the influence of, uh, how, how much Holy Spirit applied word is in your spirit? The Capital One has an ad campaign featuring Samuel L. Jackson. And it does a playing the dozens kind of challenge by Capital One of other credit card companies and their power to generate cash back benefits by saying, what's in your wallet? Sometimes circumstances challenge us and force the question to be asked of us, what's in your spirit? Amen. Family member dies, what's in your spirit? People get on your nerves, what's in your spirit? You see someone that looks just fine and you already married to somebody else, what's in your spirit? Got painted into a corner, what's in your spirit? What, who has more influence on you? God, self, or the enemy? So through the prophet Isaiah, God paints a picture. He uses Isaiah chapter 50 as a comparison of someone under the influence of God's lordship who has been taught God's word and who understands God's word and someone who was under the influence of their own self and their own desires. Verse 11 says... If, that, that if you decide to kindle your own fire rather than walk by my light, then you're on your own. Ultimately, you shall lie down in sorrow. This means that if you kindle your own fire, if you decide to follow your own leadership, if you try to handle things on your own or try to figure things out by yourself and not rely on what I've promised you and what I've written to you, then, then, then and, and, and don't allow God inf to influence your thinking, then you'll probably get burned. Oh! But beloved, good things can happen when your mind and your spirit have been not only been under the influence of self, but rather been influenced by God through God's word. Now, Isaiah, the prophet, is the example. He, he was one whose message was not well accepted. Folk thought he was crazy. Isaiah took a lot of abuse. But when he was with, but he was willing to go through it because his mind and his spirit were under the control of somebody who was greater. The one whose mind and heart are the personification of God's influence, the man Jesus Christ. What are the characteristics of the mind that has been influenced by God's spirit? Well, when you're under God's Spirit's influence, you'll talk right. Oh. Isaiah said, God has given me the tongue of the learned. It, all, it means that when you're under the influence of God, when you open up your mouth, you have access to God's words. It means that you know God's word and that you're led in your speaking by the Holy Spirit and don't just let any old thing come out of your mouth. When my mind is under the influence of God's word, it means that when I move my lips to talk about somebody, it's to bless them and to encourage them not to drag them through the mud. It means that when I open my mouth to speak the truth, 
but, but, but always it, to speak it's the truth but always as Ephesians puts it to speak the truth in love not just to vent so I can be heard it means that when I speak I have what God wants said and what's best for my hearer in mind so that even if I disagree with you I ought to be able to say something in a way that lets you know that I love you and I want what's best for you. The tongue of the learned is not an arrogant tongue and doesn't speak as one who knows everything, but speaks as one who's learned something and wants to impart them and to benefit the hearer. It speaks life over people, not death. If somebody's always speaking death, always criticizing, never has anything positive to say, that mind has not been influenced by God's word. Your mind, your, your mind is under the influence of God's word. And when your spirit is under the influence of God's spirit, God has control of your tongue. Yeah, yeah. Speaks right. Secondly, verse 5 says, because Isaiah has the inf has is under God's influence, he hears right. Isaiah says, God has opened his ear and he was not rebellious. It means that he hears God's voice and that voice has a stronger influence on his behavior even than his own voice. His behavior was guided and led not by his own desires, but by God's word. How easy it is, beloved, for us to deceive ourselves and decide that what I want must be what God wants. <laughs> Amen. That's, that's what's wrong with name it, claim it theology. I said, oh, what I want, I want that. I want that fine vehicle over there. I want that house on the hill. Amen. That must be what God wants. Amen. It, it just discounts the fact that stuff that I name might just come out of my selfish nature and have nothing to do with God's will for my life. But God wants our minds to be attentive and responsive to the voice of God. God wants us to place uh, God wants us to, to place where God's, uh, what God's priorities for us as highest priority. Amen. All God has to do when God wants to get our attention, if our minds have been trained, is to do just a little tug on us. God doesn't have to send an earthquake. God didn't have to send a lightning storm or a hurricane to get our attention. Amen. But, but all God has to do is tug on the left rein a little bit and I'll go left. Or tug on the right rein a little bit and I'll go right. Amen. And some of us, God tells to go to Nineveh like Jonah. And we on our way to Tarsus. The other way. Say what? Did, 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 hello? Hello? But if we just had gone to Nineveh in the first place, we could have saved ourselves and the Ninevites a great deal of aggravation. Some of us, God has been telling to make that phone call for the longest time. God's been telling you to step up and volunteer, but, but you've been waiting until it's convenient for you. God's been telling you to help somebody, but you've been waiting till you think they deserve it. But when our mind is influenced by the Word of God and the Spirit of God, it's not a matter of what I want, but it's a matter of what God says. It's what God wants done, when God wants it done, how God wants it done. Hallelujah. Talks right. Hears right. Finally, when your mind is under influence of God's word and God's spirit, God will make you able to withstand. Verse 7 says that when I'm under God's influence, the Lord God will help me. Isaiah said that even when they beat his back, pulled the hair from his chin, spit in his face, God made him tough enough to handle it. You can't do that on your own. When we become new believers, people step on our last nerve. And the enemy seems like he just wants to throw us off of our spot. 
He tries to do everything that he can to push us in a direction that is contrary to God's word. But, but when we feed our mind enough of God's word and that word begins to get into our system of beliefs, our belief system, amen, God makes us tough enough to handle it. He, he, Isaiah couldn't do it on his own, but he could do it because he had enough of God's word in his mind and God's spirit in his heart and God was fighting his battles. Paul tells the Ephesians, don't be full of wine, but be drunk with the spirit. Not spirits, but spirit. Amen. <laughs> He means that your mind needs to be saturated, immersed, fully doused with God's word and, and your heart with God's spirit in order content to contend with the challenges of life that, that, will God, that the enemy will bring your way. Is there anybody here that's full of the spirit of God? God says that if you'll keep your mind under my influence, I'll toughen you up. I'll make you stronger than you've ever been. Your mind is going to need to be full of the word and your spirit full of God's spirit because the enemies of doubt, fear, and discouragement are going to try to strike your back. But if you're under God's influence, you can say like Isaiah, who is my enemy? Who's my adversity? Let him come near to me. In other words, Isaiah was saying, bring it on. Devil, you got a hater to send my way. Bring it on. I'm drunk with the spirit of love. You say you got a personal attack. Well, bring it on because I'm saturated with the spirit and I got the promises of God in my mind. Do I see a, a cloud of sadness on the horizon? Well, bring it on because I got the spirit of joy and the word of God tells me that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Whatever you got, bring it on because I got my mind right. And when my mind is right. He can train my spirit so that whatever comes my way, I can stand up and face it. Come what may. Got my mind made up. I'm not going anywhere. God has me in his hand. I'm under the control of God. My mind is under his influence and I'm going on through for Jesus Christ. We have to take in enough information so that we can walk in a way that pleases God and so that we can be good disciples of Jesus Christ. It doesn't come naturally, y'all. It doesn't come by osmosis, well, only by spiritual osmosis, but it only comes by us being intentional about taking in God's word. Would you stand, please?